Kettleman City is a small farm worker town of 1,500 residents and one of the birthplaces of California's mighty environmental justice movement. Diesel fumes from trucks, pesticide runoff from agriculture, and one of the largest toxic waste dumps in the nation have residents wondering how all this pollution is hurting their community. Maricela Mares Alatore and her son Miguel are lifelong Kettleman City residents fighting for environmental justice in their town. My name is Maricela Mares Alatore and um, I'm a resident of Kettleman City for 42 years now. I'm a community organizer for uh, Green Action for Health and Environmental Justice. And prior to that, my parents formed a group called People for Clean Air and Water of Kettleman City, El Pueblo para la Agria y Agua Limpia de Kettleman City. They uh, formed it in response to a proposed toxic waste incinerator in the town, which they defeated in the early 90s. And so I kind of continued their organizing work and still today we're still dealing with permitting and agencies. We still live in a town that's home to the largest toxic waste dump in the Western United States. And we do a lot to watchdog them uh, to make sure that the agencies that regulate the uh, company are upholding laws that are there to protect uh, human health. My name's uh, Miguel Alatorre and I'm a third generation community activist. I was pretty much raised into this movement. If you ask, where else is there to dump trash? Well, there's Kettleman City, which has uh, chemical waste management. And then we have Westmoreland and Buttonwillow, which have a clean arbors facility in each. One is not active, the one in Westmoreland isn't, but the one Buttonwillow is. And what are the three things, or what are the many things that these communities have in common? They're all Latino, they're all Spanish speaking, um, low education, poverty, um, people that don't really speak up for themselves. And so it's like, why do these small communities always have to bear the brunt of everyone else's pollution? Like the trash that I make that goes into my cans doesn't ever see that landfill because they don't accept normal municipal waste. You know, it's only hazardous waste. And so it's like, why don't I get to send my toxic waste to Los Angeles or to Beverly Hills or, you know, some other place where, you know, people are, are uh, doing a little bit better money-wise, um, it's always these small communities that have to take all the waste. It's these kinds of inequities that have inspired UC Davis researcher Claire Cannon to take on a new project. Today, I'm driving down to Kettleman City to continue my pilot project into environmental health with community residents. I've made almost 10 trips in the past year coming down, meeting with community residents, community partners to discuss their environmental health concerns. My goal is to do rigorous and independent scientific research and put it in the hands of the community so that they can advocate for themselves. So today we've been doing air sampling of VOCs in Kettleman City um, in order to understand what might be occurring in the air that could have um, harmful effects for human health. Can you guys see what I'm doing? I'm setting up this little machine to take air, what we're breathing right now, and measure it. Isn't that cool? Yeah? Do you like science? Yeah, it's pretty cool. So VOCs are volatile organic compounds. Um, so they're gases in the air, um, and some of them could pose a threat to human health. So we're measuring them in order to understand what's in the air that people are breathing um, so we can better understand uh, exposure to the environment as well as potential health effects. Cannon is leading a small-scale pilot study in Kettleman City to see if there's enough evidence to do a larger research project. If there is, a new study could tease out the ways pollution, race, and ethnicity affect people in poor communities like Kettleman City. This is what environmental justice is all about. 
Kettleman City has been on the front lines of environmental justice movements here in California, but also nationally and internationally. Some of the threats that they face in terms of environmental, environmental pollution are the class one hazardous waste landfill that's located just down the street. Um, it's one of two currently operating class one hazardous waste landfills. And those are the kinds of landfills that primarily take oil production processy waste. So it's kind of the most toxic stuff that we produce as a society and it's distributed here. There's also concerns about pesticide drift from the commercial agricultural production that surrounds the community. Another concern is traffic. So we're a community that lies at the intersection of California 41 um, and I-5, which runs north-south. And as such, there is uh, possible um, and probable pollution from that dense traffic. We really seek to empower communities through this sort of community-engaged research design. So the goal is to try to answer, begin to answer, residents' questions around environmental health. So what's in their environment and how that might be affecting their health. It's really important for communities and scientists to work together because it increases not only the scientific rigor, but also the relevance of that work. Benefiting communities um, in the study of the problems that affect them. So communities benefit from working with scientists um, to share their knowledge with scientists, um, but also learn about the research process, learn about what kinds of research they can do in their own communities um, to advance their community well-being. UC Davis has an incredibly special role to play in research such as this. And communities like this who've faced high environmental injustices, um, there has been a long history of distrust with the government at local, county, and state levels. And UC Davis, as a public university, has a role to play in uh, independent work that we can do to bridge um, both the distrust from the state and the distrust um, from the local community to really answer these questions in a meaningful way, both for the community residents and for policy makers and regulators. The community's lack of confidence in state officials was brought to a head in 2009 when a cluster of birth defects, including cleft palate, surfaced in Kettleman City. Our top story, what's behind an unusual spike in birth defects? They're calling on the county to temporarily stop plans to build or expand any business that could increase pollution in the area. CBS 47's Rebecca Lindstrom says families want to figure out what's causing the problem. My daughter was born in 2008 in the middle of a, <clears throat> a rash of unexplained birth defects in Kettleman City. Uh, between 2007 and 2009, a period of 14 months, we had 13 children born with um, uh, birth defects. Five of them were born with cleft palate. Three of them passed away. So uh, five cleft palate births in a community of 1,500 people is a definite red flag. And my daughter was born during the middle of all that. The cluster of birth defects galvanized parents and other activists who pressured the state to investigate in 2010. That same year, the state fined the Kettleman Hills Hazardous Waste Landfill more than $300,000 for mismanaging PCBs, which are linked to cancer and many other health problems. Kettleman Hills was the only federally regulated landfill in California at the time that handled PCBs. Nevertheless, two California state agencies that investigated the birth defects cluster found that there was no evidence linking the birth defects to the landfill or other environmental conditions. Residents criticized the state's investigation for not accepting enough community input or taking the blood samples necessary to identify PCB exposure. There's no pattern or common cause to the birth defects in Kettleman City. That's what the state is saying tonight after studying the problems plaguing the small Kings County town.
I get so angry that, um, you know, it's systemic problems. Uh, the system is set up to always be on the side of industry um, over uh, the community's health. When they permit all these things in our town that um, they know that it's harmful, but it's more important that industry needed some place to dump their toxic waste, so they were gonna go ahead and permit it anyway. That's when you have to fight against them and you have to demand that they uphold the laws that are already there to protect people. My daughter was born beautiful and healthy and we were very blessed, but um, 11 days after she was born, um, her cousin had uh, a baby that was born with cleft palate. So I'm very lucky in that my daughter's super healthy. She does have asthma, which is a huge issue here in town. People have asthma because we're in an area where we have very, very poor air quality. Continued activism led to a historic civil rights agreement in 2016 between the state and Kettleman City residents. Part of how this study got started was really out of a 2016 um, civil rights case that um, community partners won saying that more research was needed into uh, harmful, potential harmful effects related to the landfill. In 2010, the state conducted two studies, one using secondary health data and the other one collecting um, soil samples from the community and water samples from the community. And they came to the conclusion that there was um, no correlation between the number of birth defects in the landfill. I think this ties into what I heard years later when I came to work with the community is frustration um, with that study, uh, with those two studies, um, in part because they felt like they understood what was happening in their community and that the state studies didn't take their voices into account. Our study did a few things differently from the state study. We used a community-engaged community participatory action research approach. Um, and this really involved the community throughout the study, um, which allowed us to sample from individual households. Um, it allowed us to build trust and to sample from residents um, to take biological samples, uh, in this case, blood, to test for PCBs. Um, and we made sure that all of our research materials are accessible in Spanish and English and that we have um, personnel on the study that were fluent in Spanish. Um, after two years, all of the results from water sampling, air quality sampling, biological sampling, and the community health survey, the results are in. Hi, well, it's great to see you, Miguel and Maricela, um, here, you know, remotely, virtually. Um, and uh, I just wanted to share with you, you know, as community partners on this research we've been doing as residents of Kettleman, um, the work that we've done so far. So I've put together a slideshow of the study results. These are preliminary results, but we did find some concerning numbers in the air and water samples we gathered. From our air sampling, we found no direct signs of the carcinogen benzene, but we did find possible signs of benzene derivatives like benzyl chloride. We also found high levels of particulate matter and carbon in the air, which is an indicator of diesel pollution. From our water sampling, we found levels of arsenic that exceeded federal limits, but we did not find high levels of pesticides, which are notoriously difficult to capture. We also took biological samples, specifically blood, from 10 residents to look for evidence of PCBs, but these data are still being analyzed. Really, I want to stress that this is preliminary research and analysis. So a lot of these analyses are preliminary, but the research itself is preliminary um, in part because we had this seed funding um, to do this work. Um, and hopefully we can use that then to leverage more resources to really expand out the, the really great work we've been able to do together. I think our goal was always to uh, be able to present something to the community uh, even if it was inconclusive. Um, and I, I would hope that continued study would allow us to do that on a broader. I think that people, uh, citizen science, you know, putting this data in the hands of the community really validates us. Um, you know, as activists, sometimes we're written off, like um, they're so emotional and they're talking about their feelings. And 
um, having data like this in our hands is so powerful. It validates our concerns and it gives us something to be able to work with policymakers that they'll take us seriously. It was just a great overall experience um, getting to work with you and everyone else. Um, I know that some of the community members were my family members and that they mentioned that this is the first time that someone really showed like a true compassion and a, a real want to figure out what's going on here in Kettleman and uh, give us results. And so we're really glad that we have um, some data to go off on now. It's really hard to do community engaged research and it is absolutely worth it. It's really empowering for researchers and for communities to produce and access this data and leverage it um, to empower their own communities to try to, to fight against injustices that they experience. Um, and that is, is really, really important work. And the Environmental Health Science Center makes that work possible.